check her Instagram and her Twitter to make sure I haven't missed anything she's posted. Sometimes she tweets the funniest things. And then of course, I have to react to her Instagram story. Hard eyes, of course. <laughs> Sometimes she responds back. She responded back to me. She said, shut up. <laughs> We're taking things slow. Uh, right now she has a boyfriend. <laughs> She's totally fine. Oh my god, fucking god. Yeah, this is fucking god. Hi. <laughs> yeah, this is your laundry. He's doing it. Hey, can you separate, like, colors and whites, you know? Oh, don't yeah. worry. He's already doing it. Make sure. I pay for their dinners, and uh, I pay her rent. More. Yeah, more. More. Do you know where I'm going tonight? Yes. Me and Spencer are going out? Yes. And you're gonna, yes, you're gonna use that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Him. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If she posts a song on her story, I've got tickets to that concert, you know, immediately. I've got front row tickets for her and, you know, the guy she likes. Have fun! If you post anything on Instagram, I'll be the first to react to it. I uh, have no idea how they got my high school dating life on video, uh, but that was it. <clears throat> if, uh, like Pastor Jeff was saying, or Jeff was saying, um, yeah, I, if you're kind of just started tracking with us, so I have had the privilege of being the project lead pastor for the last six and a half years. And uh, before I kind of get into tonight, uh, what I wanted to say was uh, literally just thank you. Um, those who are here, who have relationship with me, or maybe just have been in, uh, have been at the project for the last little bit or the last number of years, those watching online, thanks, honestly, um, for letting me play a role in your life. I never took it lightly. Uh, it was something that I was an incredible joy, and, 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 and it was something that I, I knew I couldn't take lightly because to have someone allow space or room in their head, in their heart, in their spiritual life, to challenge them, to encourage them, to move them and push them forward, that is a huge responsibility and a huge privilege. And so thank you for the last six and a half years for letting me do that. I have married some of you. I have uh, given you a relationship advice. I have helped you walk with Jesus. Uh, maybe some of you I've infuriated. Thank you for letting me make you mad. And uh, thank you for letting me be part of your life. And it's funny, as I was thinking through tonight, um, you know, I, I was thinking, what do I, do I want to do like a goodbye message, right? Like, do I want to do something where just like, you know, if, if I can leave you with something. But to be honest, one of the things that I love about the project and why I loved doing it and why there's this bittersweet moment here today is because the project allowed me to say everything I would want to say. I have like literally no unfinished business. You know, I was actually writing out a few things that I'd leave you with, but I can probably track back a number of years, even the last few months where I can say, well, I kind of already said that. I already did that. I don't have unfinished business. You allowed us, allowed me to say what I feel like needed to be said in the way that I need to be said. That's a great freedom of the project is that we are meant to kind of walk and do life together. And I got to be honest with you, I am, I am just a little ahead of the game of you. That's it and you let me process with you. And so I don't have a lot of unfinished business. And to be honest, I actually specifically chose to finish and to kind of complete my tenure here at the project with this series, this month. Here's why. Over the last few years, and when I started the project, we always had like February's like relationship month, right? You know, like every church does it. And for the first couple of years, you know, you do the kind of thing, it's like, you know, how do you like be single? How do you date? How do you get married? Blah, 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 right? And, and we kind of took it for granted, but then I, I clued into something pretty quickly after the first few years was that I, I began to realize that the way that you, the way that we process our understanding of God happens in relationships to other people. And at this age, there's nothing more important than finding someone to do life with, whether that's friends or that's finding a significant other. But what we really want to do is we want to find out, God, who do you have in my life? Who am I going to walk through life with? Because that is where most of your questions come from. And I realize that this is probably one of the most important things that we could ever do as a young adult ministry is to help you relate to other people well, because I, th I honestly believe 
It's a way that you discover what God has for you, who you are, who you're not. And so I wanted to make sure that if I was gonna finish this thing off, I wanted to do it in February. And I gotta be honest, I'm gonna go ahead with their plan. I'm gonna get into some red flags, yellow flags of relationships because honestly, so much of our identity is formed by the relationships that are closest to us, especially the ones that we choose to do life with for the rest of our life. It's why majority of your questions and curiosity is around the idea of being single or dating, how do I do it well, or, or marriage, or how do I have really good friends, because that is how you are forming your identity. That's how you're discovering who you are and who you're not. You want to share your life with, and honestly, that's actually a biblical thing. You're going to read that in the Bible. Right at the beginning, God says, it is not good for us to be alone. Listen, in this garden that was made perfect, where God said this was good, that was good, that was very good, the fact that you were or Adam was alone is not very good. And so some people are like, I, I wish I didn't long so much for somebody. I'm like, no, you don't. You were made to long for somebody. You were made to be in community and be in relationship. That is how God designed it. And I honestly think one of the best ways we can grow in our faith, one of the best ways we can grow in our understanding of who God is, one of the best ways we can understand who we are and how God has shaped us and made us is with how we relate to each other. I'll go as far as say this. I don't think there's really such thing as a, as a personal relationship with God that is disconnected from a community. We need each other. We need each other to discover who we are and who we're not. So if it's wrong, if we get relationships wrong, what happens is that it can mess up a lot of our understanding of who we are as individuals. It can mess up our understanding of who other people are, how we view them, and it can mess up the way that we understand God. For example, let me read you this study. So studies have shown that when romantic partners who are intensely in love are exposed to photographs of their beloved, the brain regions that become activated are the same regions that are activated in cocaine addicts when they're craving cocaine. How does that make you feel? Healthy love is likely to involve other qualities as well, such as respect, trust, commitment, qualities that keep a relationship strong even on those days when excitement and passion are not at the forefront. Addictive love, by contrast, tends to be more singularly focused on attaining those highs, whatever the cost. Maybe you've seen this in some of your friends. They get into relationships, and, and it seems like at a certain juncture, they just stop. Ah, the love fizzled out. I just ain't feeling it anymore. It was a hot minute, but that's it. It was just a minute. It was done. Well, in a study published in social science research, researcher Spencer James found that all the fanfare during the honeymoon phase reinforces your intense love for each other. During the honeymoon phase, you literally feel like you just took a big hit of Whitney Houston. And these intense feelings of attraction and ecstasy are hypothesized to be caused by elevated levels of nerve growth factor, which increases euphoria and connection. Let me translate that for you. You can't help but put them on a pedestal. So you're going to say things like, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. You complete me. I've been waiting my whole life for you. You can't do anything wrong. Things like disagreements are minimal to non-existent in this honeymoon phase, and you hardly see flaws in each other. Have you met these couples? You know, they're kind of like always, right? And you're just like, he's perfect, she's perfect. And you're like, really? Because they chew really annoyingly, right? Like, but it's like nothing can go wrong. And here's the thing, it says that this honeymoon phase could last up to, listen to this, 30 months. That's two and a half years. And so what does that mean? That means that in that time, your relationship could totally suck and you wouldn't even know it. And beyond that, you could be in for spiritual and a personal wreck that you're not even noticing. This is why it's so important. And I get it, because relationships are hard. I mean, at this age, we want to gravitate, we want to hold on to them as much as we can. When we find a good person who walks in as a heartbeat, we're like, no, you're good enough for me, right? We want to hold on as much as possible, because we don't want to lose it. And you're thinking, well, well, if they're in prison, at least I know where they're at, right? And we make these excuses, because we want to keep, we want to hold on to them. Let's remember, though, Romeo and Juliet may have been star-crossed lovers, but what happened at the end? They both died. 
And so sometimes the things that we believe are so good for us, they can actually be doing so much harm. And that's something that I think we need to care about. And and like you're gonna see, it's actually something I think God cares deeply about. And you need to know, I care very deeply about. This is why the last few years we've ramped up what we do in February. We've ramped up how we process it. We've ramped up our study. We've ramped up talking with counselors and other people to figure out how can we help you figure relationships out in a way that leads you to Jesus and also leads you to have really good, healthy, sustaining relationships that even if you do break up, you're not looking back and going, man, I've got like, I literally have stories of regret. How do we reduce that risk? Because not only should you care about it, but you got to know that God cares about that for you. It's so important. And so many of us base our understanding of God on how people relate to us or how we've related to them. And some of that needs to kind of be adjusted and corrected. And so there are signs. How do we know? Well, there's signs, flags, that can kind of give us hints on whether or not we're in a good thing or a not so good thing. And it's important. Now, as we get to it tonight, you gotta know, there is tension in any long-term healthy relationship. Honestly, you know, me and my wife, we've been married, it'll be 15 years this August. And there are some things that I think we're always gonna disagree on. They're not huge, but we just will. Every relationship has tension. Every relationship has these areas where it's just like, maybe you don't see fully eye to eye, but it doesn't mean you have an unhealthy relationship. There's tension in everything. But there are a number of, I think, yellow flags that maybe you're in a relationship with someone right now, you're wondering, do I wanna go any further with this person? Or maybe you have been in a relationship and you need someone in your corner saying, hey, yo, that person's bad for you. Or you're in a relationship that's not good. Maybe you've heard it from your friends, your family, but you're just not registering. Or maybe you're just thinking, hey, I wanna get into something healthy. How do I know how to do that? And what I wanna do is help you notice from the beginning, how do we notice these signs? So not only do we have healthy relationships, but I just, I wanna make sure that you stay spiritually and individually healthy too. We have to. Relationships, all of them. They're risky, but there's some things we can do to minimize that risk. So we can limit unnecessary pain. We can limit hurt and disappointment and regret. That's what I wanna do. Proverbs 16, 25, it says this. There's a path before each person that seems bright, right, but it ends in death. How do we, how do we avoid that? I wanna go right to the beginning, literally. In Genesis chapter one, verse two, or not verse two, sorry, Genesis chapter one, if we just put it up here. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So the first thing you need to know about yourself right off the bat is this, is that God created you. You're created by God. Every part of your being, he created, he knit together. Every part of you, he made intentionally in his image. That there is not a secondary or mediator in between you and God. There's nothing in between. He created you in his image. Highly valued, highly loved, he made you. Second thing, right at the beginning, we're gonna notice this, is that we're actually created with longing. Then the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Perfect. Garden of Eden, promised land. God still says, there's something not good, that you're alone. So we were created with longing. You're created by God, and you were created with a longing for someone else. Third thing is that we're created with responsibility. So in chapter one in Genesis, this, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Basically, what God is saying is this, is that you are meant to be stewards of this world. You're meant to be responsible with how you handle yourself in relationship to others in this world. You were created in the image of God. You were created with longing, and you were created with responsibility. Translation, your sexuality is spiritual. And I want you to hear that. Your sexuality is spiritual. The reason why I want to say this is because you can't separate your relationships, your sexuality from your spiritual life. 
I mean, you can, but you're only really fooling yourself. You need to take yourself seriously. You need to take the other person seriously. You both were formed with incredible care, with incredible love, and of the highest value. God's will for you is to have a healthy, long-term, God-honoring relationship. Many of us, unfortunately, separate those two things. That I am maybe a lover and then a Christian. Yeah, I love Jesus, but the way I do my relationships is different and it doesn't inform it. Whether because we don't trust or we just deliberately don't want to, or maybe we're just ignorant of that fact. But here's the reality. You cannot separate your sexuality, your relationships from your relationship with Jesus. If you do that, you are usurping God's best for your life. See, my first red flag, I guess you can call it, or yellow flag, and this kind of goes both ways. So it's not just, sometimes it's easier to, to, to find this in someone else, but this really comes down to you, is this, is if they see their sexuality or your relationship as separate from their spiritual life, you actually raise the chances of compromised spiritual life and a slow eroding of your understanding of your identity in Jesus. Here's the thing, good, healthy relationships should lead one another to a continual discovery of what it means to be made in the image of God. Let me say that again. Good, healthy relationships should lead one another to a continual discovery of what it means to be made in the image of God, which means that even as you date, even as you're getting to know someone, what should be in the back of your head is this, Is this person leading me closer to feeling valued by God, loved by God, cared by God, made by him, or is this leading me further away? Whether it's the decisions I'm making or the decisions that I feel like they've made in their life and it's making me compromise in my thinking of that. And let me, I'll be honest with you. In a relationship that tries to do this, that is hard enough to do. If you're ignoring this, it's pretty much impossible. It's hard enough when you try to lead people in that place. But if you just decided to ignore that, it's impossible to lead each other to a point where they feel like, I am made in the image of God. I'm getting a better understanding of what he has for my life and who I am. So, where are you with Jesus? I mean, that's flag one. Where are you with him? What's your relationship like with Jesus? And maybe you're here and you're like, I got no relationship with Jesus. Jeebus, right? Like maybe that's you. You've got no understanding. You're just like, I don't even know how I got here. But it's still a good question to ask. For those of you who are attempting, like me, to continually, faithfully walk with Jesus. How is your relationship? Here's the thing. The reality is healthy people make a healthy relationship. You don't just get a healthy relationship. You can't just buy it at the store. You gotta be healthy. They gotta be healthy. You make a healthy relationship. I didn't say perfect, healthy. Same spiritually. Healthy spirituality makes spiritually healthy relationships. How are you with Jesus? How are they with Jesus? The reality is, if you are walking with Jesus, this is something you just cannot ignore. And this leads me to my second flag, and it's this. Where are you at with your faith and values? 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 15 says this. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteous be a part with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be partnered with an unbeliever? Now, I gotta say this. It's not saying like if you're an unbeliever, you are the devil. That's not what it's saying. Paul is trying to make very stark contrasts here. And I'll go as far as saying this. Even if you were in this room and you had no faith and maybe an Eastern religious faith. I would actually say kind of the same thing to you as I'm about to say. 
When it comes to your faith and your values, it touches virtually everything in your life. I know some of you have heard me talk about this before, and I feel like it's something I have to continually repeat because it's easy to forget. And because our values and our faith touches everything in our life, and we have differing values, a differing faith, because it touches so much, you increase exponentially the risk for compromise, chaos, or a growing chasm between you two. And the longer it goes, the more serious those three things can become. This isn't just about car maker preferences. It's not just like, I like domestic, I like imports. This is literally about how you raise your kids. It's about how you, what kind of communities you share. It's about, am I going to church by myself? Am I, do I have this part of my life, this intimate part of my life that I cannot share with this person? They may be accepting of it. They may even just honor it. And they may even come with me a little bit. But their marriage is about trying to fuse two lives together. But if you've got this one thing that's constantly separate, I'm telling you, there's either going to be a compromise, there's going to be a ton of chaos, or a growing chasm, if not all three of those things in relationships. I have seen it over and over and over again. You cannot convince me of anything different. Now, I know some of you are like, well, I got saved while I'm in a relationship with this person. What does that mean for me? That means some really tough conversations. Some people's like, I, I got married and, and, you know, my spouse got saved or, you know, I found Jesus or whatever the case. And, you know, Bobby Lubin talks about that. It says to continually pray for your spouse. It talks about serving them and loving them. But it also talks about that there could be a huge risk of chasm, compromise, chaos. I'm saying before you step into it, this has to be a really serious conversation in your head. Who's going to be praying with you? What kind of community? Dealing with loss of circumstances? The Bible talks about this idea of being unequally yoked, and the, the concept is these two animals yoked, and, and if you've got two animals that one is weaker or shorter than the other, what happens is that they kind of just go in a circle and they ruin the field. And I know a lot of you are farmers in this room, so you get that. It's basically happens is that either someone is dragging you so there can be a sense of chaos and I gotta say this if you're someone in this room and you follow Jesus and you're dating someone who doesn't it is extremely unfair for you to say you're perfect except for this it's really, really an unfair expectation for them to live up to because walking with Jesus or not walking with Jesus are two major decisions. Or there's an ever curling line of compromise. It's one of you are giving up here or there. Either you're giving up on faith or they're giving up not having any faith. And it's unfair to have someone cave into that without them feeling like they can make those decisions. Or like I said, just a growing chasm. You live your life, I'll leave my, live mine. And we always think we're going to be fine until it's too late, until the big decisions come. And I just think it's unfair to expect someone to adopt a whole way of living purely because of feelings. And this is why I think the Bible is very clear on it, not because it's trying to be a jerk. It's because, again, if you were of any faith, I'd say the exact same thing. If you can't match up in some of the most intimate personal details of why and how you live with the other person, you increase the risk of compromise, chaos, or a chasm between you two. This will become a real issue. The further you go, the deeper you get into it. Okay, let's move on, because some of you are like, I already don't like you. I'm glad you're leaving. Okay, next flag. <clears throat> Do you want the same thing? So Psalm 139, 13 says this about you. It's coming up right away. You made all my delicate inner parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's room. Basically saying, God knows you. He made you. Listen, whether you follow Jesus or not, that is true about you. Whether you like it or not, he made you. And what I mean by this is that you were created 
a certain way. You've got gifts, you've got talents, you've got desires, there's things you want to do. It's like, I need somebody like, yeah, I can't wait. We're dating, we're going to get married, I want to travel the world. And he's like, I want to stay home. Okay, what about travel? I hate planes and the rest of the world. Okay, um, have you talked about this? Oh, we'll work it out on the plane. He's not getting on the plane with you, right? Like it's just... It, there's these obvious things to talk about of going, are you wanting the same thing? Or maybe, you know, he wants to get really serious and she's like, nah, I'm not really there just yet. And there's this constantly dragging and these, these conversations back and forth. And I'm like, man, this person is not wanting the same thing that this person wants. There are two different places in life and that's okay. But do you recognize that maybe you're just in two different places? You're going two different directions. That it's not going really well. That where you want your life to go, where they want theirs is just not there. Or maybe they're just not in that season of life where they know what they want to go to school for. They know what their life wants to be like. And I got to be honest with you, I see so many young adults compromise on their passions in life purely because they've got passion in their pants. And I got to tell you, passion in your pants is a lot easier than passion in life. And work out your passion in your life. I'm not saying you got to have that all figured out, but you should have a general direction of where you want to go. Because at some point, you, it raises the risk of, let's say, and I've seen this, where couples, they get married, and, and then a person, they change, they adapt, they're finding something out, and they end up actually resenting each other because it's like, this is not what we signed up for. And i got to tell you, life is still the change. Me and Catherine, we look last 15 years, so much of our life has changed, but... The idea is that we made a commitment to go the same direction we want to go, and that's the commitment we've made. We work it out, and we have, and God has been faithful. But if you feel like your life is going two different directions, guys, like, pay attention to it. And like, well, this person's going through a lot of stuff. And I'll say this, a good time for you to kind of think maybe you got to break this off or put some space is when you care about their issues more than they care about their own issues. If you find yourself caring more about their life and, and, and you know, applying to college or university or dealing with their health issues or whatever, you care more about them than they care for themselves, there's a certain point where you gotta say, I don't know if this is actually healthy for the both of us. Love isn't built on guilt. And so you're not married, don't act like it. Dating is that moment of time where you have the space and the freedom to decide, is this really the best direction for me and for us? And I gotta say, loyalty is not found in the fruit of the Spirit. There's some people, and some of you are dealing with some really serious mental health issues, or even just health issues. And it's made it difficult to enter into a safe space with someone else to have those relationships. And I'm not saying you can't have relationships. All I'm saying is this. For your own good, make sure you're pursuing health. You're reaching out. You're asking for help. You deserve it. You were created by God, highly valued, highly loved, and he cares deeply about you. Seek out help. You deserve it. And it's hard because the challenge is like, is this going to make it worse for this person? Creating a sense of codependency actually makes it worse. Research shows that over and over and over again. There's a lot of you carrying very heavy burdens that you were never meant to carry because you don't have the skills, the education, the temperament, and you could be making it worse. If you find yourself caring more about their stuff than they care about their own, that could be a good indication that this could be veering off into some unhealthy directions. Next. Catherine plugged the kids' ears. Are you in it just for the sex? Song of Songs says this, chapter 2, verse 7. Promise me not to awaken love until the time is right. This is an incredibly passionate book of the Bible. You read it and it'll make you blush because it talks very openly about sexual passion and that we're created for that and it's good when it's healthy and when it's right. But I need to say something very clear and maybe you've heard me say this before, but when relationships get physical very fast, 
it is actually almost impossible for you to find out what's real and what's not in your relationship. What physical, physical relationships, what very sexual relationships do, especially if it starts off hot and heavy, is it actually masks by making you feel like you're actually more intimate than you are. Because you shared something very vulnerable and transparent, but let me tell you, sex is easy. Intimacy is hard. Sex is the easiest form of intimacy. Literally, animals can do it. That doesn't set your relationship apart. Intimacy does. Vulnerability. Walking through stuff together. Intimacy is a wide, varying plane built over long periods of time. Sexual physical intimacy is a powerful stimulant that actually can numb every other need you may have in a relationship. Like if you were to take away all the physical aspects of your relationship, the questions you want to be asking yourself is what's left? Like would you even be friends with this person? When was the last time your time together didn't lead to the physical? How did you feel? How did they feel or act? Was it weird? Was it awkward? Do you not know what to talk about? How do they actually treat you outside of that sexual relationship? What are your, or what are their deepest held values and beliefs? Do they live them out? Are you? Is this actually getting you closer to them or further? Listen, sex is easy, intimacy is hard. And when we jump into it so fast, it can mask what's actually going on in your relationship. The next flag. Are you in it because there's literally nothing better for you to do? This is a real thing. So in Proverbs, it says it's better to have little with godliness than to be rich and dishonest. Desperation rarely breeds healthy decisions but almost always leads to regret. It's a sign of identity formation issues in you. Either you're overestimating your own or miscalculating your worth, but more than anything, you are devaluing someone else's worth to get what you want. When you know that you're just in it because there's just no one else. And there's this dishonesty in it and open to hurting someone. If you think you're in it just because you're bored or because you're lonely, I'm telling you, you're going to hurt yourself more than help yourself. Next, is it because you need it? So, In 2012, there were already 18 studies that followed the same people over time as they went from being single to getting married. They did not become happier than they were when they were single, except sometimes for a brief honeymoon effect early on. Marriage only amplifies problems. It doesn't solve them. And there's a difference between wanting a relationship and needing a relationship. To want it is normal and natural and it's good, but it should lead to some wise decision making. But if you need it, I'm telling you right now, it usually just makes problems worse. And I think you've gotta be thinking to yourself, how do I measure the difference between me really needing it and me just wanting a relationship? It's okay and good to want, but just be, you know, a lot of people, they'll get married because they're just, they're desperate, they wanna get into it. I'm telling you, it makes things Harder, not better. It exaggerates problems. Next, did God tell you to marry this person? Exodus 20 verse 7 says this, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. I thought that was funny. Um, Because I think, and can I share an honest story with you? And I always hesitate in sharing this story because it kind of seems like it's contradictory what I've been saying. Me and my wife met in a very interesting way. So we were going to college together. We became friends. She was dating some other guy, total loser. But uh, no, um, another guy, a really nice guy, but wasn't me. And um, I remember I was 
uh, in my room, and I remember praying, and I felt so strongly that I was meant to meet Catherine. I'm not this hokey guy this way. I mean, I just told you, don't use Lord's name in vain, right? Like, but I remember being like, you know, God, like, this could just be me and my thirst. You know, like, I need to know this is you. You got to speak to her. And, and even when we did talk and she's like, you know what, like, God's put you on my heart too. We actually took months before even deciding to date. She had her people, I had my people. We were actually weren't even in the same city for a number of months. And just processing it, thinking about it. She talked to people she trusted with. I talked to people I trusted with. And, and so it's not like I'm like, hey, Catherine, God told me to marry you. And Catherine's like, okay, let's do this, right? Like, and some people are like that. It's like, I was just across the room and I saw you worshiping and I was like, God told me, you're gonna be my wife, right? You know, actually, I'm already married. I don't get it. That is a great thing to say, ladies uh, or guys. You know, it's like, oh, that's funny. I'm married. Um, you know, a lot of people say this and they do this. And, and I got to be honest with you. You're probably wrong. Like, most likely wrong. And here's what I mean by it. Even if this was the case, one thing I know Catherine and I will say is that it actually puts a really, really heavy expectation and I, you know, it's one of the reasons why I tell a lot of people, before you get engaged, do premarital. If you really start getting engaged, do premarital before. Because there's no pressure of a date and, and money and things like that. You can take your time. And you can figure this stuff out. And same, when you tell someone, it's like, yeah, we believe God put us together. There's like a really, really heavy expectation. If this doesn't work out, does it mean God was wrong? Who sinned? What happened? My world's blown apart. And I can say this, God is not a God of confusion. I don't think that God has one person for you. I believe there's instances where that happened, but those are far and few in between. God has given us a brain, has given us wisdom to be able to make some healthy, wise decisions. That's a really unhealthy expectation. And one thing I noticed too is actually removes the mundane part of a relationship, of just everyday life, of not having a marriage thinking about all the time. And that's something that I think even Catherine would say, like we dated, but really we knew we were kind of getting married and we never really did the mundane part of the relationship. We had to do that afterwards. And it could remove that time. And so I'd say, how do you hear God's voice? Well, I'll say this. If you think that God is speaking to you about someone, I say put it on a shelf. And what I mean is, let it sit there for a while. Pray over it. Give it time. Maybe you had bad tacos. Maybe you had really good tacos. I don't know. And you had a spiritual experience. I mean, I've had that before. You know, and think through it. Leave it there for a while. Pray about it. Tell a friend who's going to laugh at you and then seriously pray with you, right? Because they probably should laugh at you. You know, give it some time. Talk with someone who you know, who you trust. Give it some time. Let it flesh out. And I've, nine times out of 10, it probably won't. And like I said, me and Catherine took a good while to think through those things. We had some really honest conversations about what this is. And we got married because we wanted to get married. But it puts a really big weight on someone. Don't throw that around flippantly. If you're someone who said that to more than one person, you're hearing maybe off a little bit, okay? So don't totally trust your hearing. Next, friends and parents don't like them. Proverbs says this, plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. Um, I know that Pastor Amanda spoke on this two weeks ago, the idea of like dating and community. And so I, don't, I won't go into this too much, but if your friends and or your parents that you like and trust don't like them, that is a huge yellow red flag. I'm not saying they're always right, but you better pay attention to that. Because at some point, you're gonna need your friends and you're gonna need your parents. You just will. It may not be now because you're in the honeymoon phase and they can't do anything wrong, but when they do, you may not have anyone to run to. Heed the advice of your friends. In fact, I'd go as far as saying what Pastor Amanda said, date in community. Safest way of doing it. Next, only got a couple more. You're ignoring something kind of obvious. 
Proverbs says this, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. There's something about them that you know you're kind of, it's obvious and you're kind of ignoring it, right? Like they can't ever seem to be alone either while dating or when they're not dating. They just can't ever be alone. They perpetually in relationships over and over again. That's a red flag or a yellow flag. I, I don't know how to distinguish them anymore, but that's, that's where you're at. Okay, that's something obvious. You gotta pay attention to that. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It could just mean that there's something they gotta work through in their life, okay? There's a major character flaw. Like maybe they just get super angry really fast or maybe they've got some stuff that they're not dealing with, maybe past relationships or maybe with their parents or something like that or they're dealing with some health issues and they're just not dealing with it and you're ignoring it, that is a yellow flag. They're endlessly critical or judgmental of other people or of you. That is a yellow flag. You feel worse when you're with them or after being with them. You feel manipulated. Their friends are terrible and they suck and you would never be their friends. I gotta tell you this way and some people may not agree with me but I, I will take it to the bank. Show me your friends and I'll show you what your future could look like. There's nothing that will shape your life more than the relationships you have, especially with your friends. If their friends suck, it's a good indication that the person you're dating may also suck or at least have poor judgment. How do they respond to your challenges? Do they get overly defensive, and maybe they do, but then like, you know what, I'm sorry, I got overly defensive. Or they're just not serious about their life. They don't seem to be able to talk about their stuff. They won't deal with their stuff. They're unsure of who they are and what they want, or their social media is cause for concern. Girls, if your guy is following tons of almost nude women on their social media, I guarantee you that is not a healthy relationship with those almost nude women. <laughs> Guys, the same goes for you. And if you find yourself in a perpetual situation where you're following and engaging in things that are not leading to a healthy sexual ethic or healthy viewpoint on the other sex, that's a problem. And I, can I encourage you? there's healing for you. That will not help you in any of your relationships. It is perpetually damaging. Last one. Are you having to be someone else for them? <clears throat> the verse says this. You are beautiful, my darling, beautiful beyond words. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair falls in waves like a flock of goats winding down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are as white as sheep, recently shorn and freshly washed. Your smile is flawless, each tooth matched with its twin. Those are my vows, actually. That's what finally drove Catherine crazy about me, was I write this because, like, Honestly, that's super awkward for me to read. Like, I'm not a very romantic person. Catherine will be honest with you. I'm not a romantic person. I wish I was more. But I love how this person was just open. This was a guy talking about his girl. He was just open about his feelings and romantic about it. Shared a poem. And you gotta find someone who allows you to be you. But a big yellow or red flags, if you feel like you gotta be someone else, you're compromising in your faith, you're compromising in your friends, your character, your boundaries, and they're constantly pushing your boundaries. And I gotta tell you, if they don't have your consent, that is bordering on sexual misconduct. You should feel like you have agency with your own body and your own mind, and your spiritual life. And if you feel like they're constantly pushing your boundaries, that person is obviously not in a healthy state to have a healthy, long-term giving relationship. You feel like you have to be someone else with your values. You always feel inferior, inferior to the person that you don't measure up, and that you feel like you just wouldn't be their friend. But the question is, why do we keep ignoring these flags, though? You know, I've said this message over and over again, and do you know that it's the most downloaded message every single year? And I'm sure many of you have heard a lot of this before. 
and you're thinking, that was a good reminder. Why do we keep falling into it? There's a few reasons. Psychologically, one is what's called the sunken cost fallacy. A lot of us feel like we put so much in a relationship, why would I want to waste all that I put into it? And so I'll just keep going for it without realizing that's a fallacy. And sometimes our past bad decisions make us feel like we can't make good decisions anymore. And I'm telling you, that's a fallacy. And so we just stay in it. Sometimes it's a fear of missing out. Well, if it's not them, am I going to get any better? And, and if you're in a relationship for so long that's, that devalues you, you're going to feel like you're not valuable enough to have something better. But here's the thing. We have this fear of missing out, but that's exactly, it's just a fear. And the Bible says that we do not live in fear, but with courage and with a sound mind. Maybe it's what you know because of family dynamics. It's what you've seen with your parents' marriage or lack thereof. Maybe no one's telling you differently. Maybe they're pressuring you. Maybe we're just insecure and have a hard time asserting ourselves. So how do we repair? How do we fix it? What are things we can do? Now, aside from cases of like, you know, cheating or abuse, things like that, you have gotta get out of it. But if you're here and you recognize these things, maybe you're here as a couple. Maybe your significant other is watching with you or just not here and you're thinking, I gotta tell you, some of this stuff is actually repairable. So I'd say this, address the issue as honestly as possible. Have what I call the 911 conversation. The one that says, listen, if we don't fix this, then it's over. We gotta fix this. I had a couple in the summer have this 911 conversation about their faith and their values. And they actually, they were engaged and they chose to break up. I didn't tell them to, they just thought, we're at a point where she took her faith so seriously. And he was honest of going, I'm just not there. And that is fair and that's good. And that's actually extremely healthy. And they decided, I don't think this is best for us as much as we love each other because they knew that in the short term it seemed so unfair, but in the long term it was the fairest and most loving thing they could do with each other and for each other. Stop texting about it with each other or with other people and talk about it. Take humility and ownership of the issue. If you're the person in the wrong, own it. Own it and deal with it. Get professional help. There are people who can help you with your own issues and with relationship issues. Reach out, ask somebody. That is normal. Take a step back, maybe pause any timelines you have and say, I need to assess this. Is this actually good? And reassess the whys. Maybe what is a big deal is not actually that big of a deal. And maybe you just need to talk about it. Maybe you need to get feedback. Maybe you need to talk to someone trusted to help you walk through it. But I'm not telling you just end the relationship, but you need to at least talk about this stuff, honestly, openly, and seriously. But maybe you're here and you're like, Thomas, I feel dirty. I've done so much wrong. I don't feel like I could get better. I feel like I'm just gonna keep doing the same thing over and over again. I'm not strong enough. I've made too many mistakes. I'm unrepairable. There's a story. I'm gonna end with the story. Matthew chapter nine says this. As Jesus was saying this, a leader of a synagogue came and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, he said, but you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand on her. It continues. So Jesus and disciples got up and went with him. Just then a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. Now you got to know, in the Jewish culture, blood was, made you unclean. And you have to go through a ceremony of being ritually cleansed. But this woman could not stop menstrual bleeding. Which means that she would separate it from community and would have been considered one of the most unpure persons there. Cast out, no community, felt dirty, couldn't be in community with anybody. She touched the fringe of his robe, for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And listen to this. Jesus turned around. And when he saw her, he said, listen, 
Don't, you, you got to take this seriously. Daughter. Not woman. Not person. Not thing. Daughter. I've got two daughters. I can't tell you how intimate it is for me to call my kids daughter and son. It means that no matter what they've done, I will always be their daddy. Jesus always turns around to those who reach out to make you whole so that you know you're not ever less than. You're not too far gone. You're not forgotten. You're not too much. Your son, your daughter. But so many of us keep ourselves from healing because we choose to live in secret. And the best thing I can leave you with as I finish this message and as I finish my tenure as your lead pastor is this. Jesus will never, ever get tired of calling you son and daughter. Ever. Whatever you've done, whoever you are in this room, he will never get tired of calling you daughter, never get tired of calling you son. Ever. My prayer for you always has been that you would know that. There's a phrase I say, and I think a lot of you have heard it, and I'll say it. I'm in your corner. Some of you have had very, very intense conversations with me about your hurt and your brokenness, and for some reason you trusted me in that space with you. And many of you have heard me say, I'll always be in your corner because I want you to know that I can only do a drop of how much Jesus is always in your corner. You're not too far. You're not too separated. You're not too dirty. You're not too much of a screw up. He will always turn around and call you daughter and son. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I never really thought about what words I would say here at the end, but honestly, I don't really care. I more care about the words that you say to us. The most important thing we can know or ever hear from you is when you say, my daughter, my son. That's why when you teach us to pray, you say, pray like this, our father. It's the most intimate term we can use. And no matter where we've been, what we've done, that we're constantly loved by you. And I pray that the way you love us would inform the way that we love each other with grace, with truth, with challenge, but knowing that, God, you have a plan for us. Help us to lead each other to what it means to be the image of Christ. More than anything, help us to always remember, you will always turn around, call us daughter, call us son. Amen. That's all I got. Thanks, guys for all of it. I'll take this off. Well, thanks, Thomas. Uh, it's been great over the last couple of years uh, getting to know Thomas. He's become one of my best friends, and uh, we've actually been talking about the project, going for coffee, for those couple of years now. So it's really exciting for me 
uh, for the last two months or so to transition and take over as the project uh, lead pastor. And um, so we're, we're thankful for everything that Thomas has done. Uh, and f for me, it's great because Thomas, in case you don't know, isn't actually going to move to another country or city. He's actually still here. If you don't know this, the project is part of a larger church called Hope City, and Thomas is moving into a role as the online campus pastor. So for me, uh, moving into this position, I still have Thomas as a friend and a co-worker to be able to bounce ideas off of, which is really valuable to me. And I know how much he cares even moving out of this role about the project and will be continuing to uh, be a real asset for me. So thank you for that. Uh, we want to keep things moving, but uh, before Thomas goes, we wanted to have a couple of people that have been really impacted by him come up and share just briefly. I thought maybe we'd have him come and sit in a chair and awkwardly sit here while they talk to him directly, but he'd probably kill me if I did that. So uh, we're not going to do that, but first we're going to call up uh, Rolanda, and uh, she's going to share a little bit about her experience with Thomas. So when I first returned to church, I struggled with feeling like I didn't belong, that I needed to have it all figured out before I felt like I deserved to be there. I'm so thankful for Pastor Thomas, um, for you seeing me, seeing my potential and calling it out of me. I've learned so much from you over the years, not only from your incredible wisdom, but from observing how you create community and love on this project community so well. A couple years ago, you made an intentional decision to invest in me and my leadership and it has changed the way that I treat and love others in my spiritual, personal, and professional life. Thank you for walking through some tough seasons with me, always keeping your office door open and meeting me in my mess. Often I'd show up um, to your office with a problem that I've let get out of control and it seems so overwhelming, and I kind of just plop it on your desk, and I felt like you've always met me with understanding and compassion, I usually end up crying for a bit, but whenever I left, um, I always had a clear direction and I felt a sense of peace because you always pointed me towards Jesus and the calling that he had placed on my life. I feel privileged to have served under your leadership, to have gotten to create and dream alongside of you, to have shared spaces where you've shared your heart for this community and the young adults of Edmonton. It has forever changed me. Your passion and dedication for the project and those who are lost was so contagious in my own life. Thank you for everything that you've done for me, as well as this community. All right, now we have Andy Lamb. Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name's Andy. Uh, where do I even begin? Uh, this guy, this dude, he's my sensei. Uh, I'm, he was with me in, you know, my lowest lows and my highest highs. Uh, I met Thomas about uh, six and a half years ago when he first started at the project. And, you know, it was probably the, the darkest time of my life. You could say I had uh, hit rock bottom. And uh, Thomas, he took me under his wing. You know, he listened to me. He bought me a ton of coffee. He bought me a ton of pho, you know, Vietnamese noodle, in case you guys don't know. Um, and we just would eat and talk and eat and talk and drink coffee. And uh, yeah, just he took the time for me. You know, he, he listened to me. He called me out, which is what I needed. And, um, you know, there's a lot of crap going on in my life. And, and he just called me out. And uh, most importantly, he called me to be a better man. And uh, one great thing about Thomas is he doesn't just, uh, you know, tell you to do something. He'll lead you in it as well. He's not going to ask you to do something he hasn't done himself. So uh, I can honestly say uh, I'm not, I wouldn't be the man I am today. I wouldn't be the husband I am today uh, if it wasn't for Thomas. Um, so thank you for your friendship your mentoring, uh, your example uh, of what it means to be a godly man, a godly husband, a faithful follower of Jesus. And um, yeah, I just, it's hard to articulate how much I uh, value our relationship. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Andy. And uh, the last person that wanted to share, she couldn't be here because she lives in Seoul, South Korea. So that got in the way. But uh, we have a video sent in from Sarah who, uh, yeah, she wanted to say a few words. Hey, Thomas, it's Sarah all the way from Seoul, South Korea. I wanted to let you know you're one of those mentors that has shown me what it means 
to meet people where they're at, no matter where they're at, and how that God's power can bring back hope and life into anybody's heart. I know I would have never made it this far without your prayers, your mentorship, and that hint of sarcasm that you bring. Thank you so much for caring about the little things that eventually led to my big dreams. I never thought I'd actually be in South Korea living out everything that I hoped for. I don't think there's enough time or words for me to explain how grateful that we've crossed paths and all the things that you've taught me. I think that your passion to pour into young people's lives is so contagious and your ability to see ordinary people do great things is so inspiring. I really hope that I can impact people's lives just as you've impacted mine. I want to leave you with a verse from 1 Peter 1, 24 to 25. And it says, All people are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. However, the word of the Lord endures forever. I know that you're leaving the project, but I know that there are so many things at the project that will last forever because you decide to shine his light and speak his words. Thank you so much, Thomas, for everything that you've done for me and the project. I know wherever you go, you'll impact so many people's lives. That's great. All right, um, we're gonna actually ask Thomas and his family, his whole family's here with him tonight to just come on up. And uh, we got one more thing before he says his, you know, I don't wanna use this terminology, but final goodbye, he'll still be available and around, but his, his last address, uh, we'll get them to kind of come and line up, try to keep our social distancing as much as we can here, uh, but just step into the light as much as you can so that the people at home watching on, uh, online can see as well. One of the things that we try to do and we value here is just honoring those who came before us. And obviously we're honoring Thomas tonight, um, but we also wanted to honor his family. You know, his kids for most of their lives have given us their dad for uh, every Sunday night for the better part of over half a decade actually. So uh, we have them a round of applause for that. And especially for his wife, Catherine, uh, who also is very supportive through that. Um, it's, as a pastor, there's nothing more valuable than a wife who's supportive or a husband husband who's supportive um, because they give up a lot of time. Uh, we wanted to give a little bit of a goodbye gift. Uh, so we wanted to have a little bit of fun. Uh, he's a little nervous because he knows I like to do weird things. But we, have, we thought it'd be too easy to just give one gift, right? So we wanted to have you choose. <laughs> like, take a chance. So we, actually what we have here is two boxes. I hope you can see it online. Yeah. Uh, so you need to choose between what's in box number one or box A, or box number two, B. A or B, not one or two. And uh, it's really important which one you pick. <laughs> so, because like one could be like a blender I got at a garage sale, or it could be a car, I don't know, whatever. So why don't you pick one up, and uh, that will be your gift, and the other one will sell on Kijiji. B? B for Belcher. Yeah, B, B for Belcher, there you go. Why don't you open that up and show, show the people what you got. It's awesome. a battery charger for a Yardworks tool. So why don't we actually bring out what that is, our lovely uh, whoever is going to come and bring out the gift, and you can only keep it, Thomas, if you can guess what's in the wrapping paper, what exactly it is. So it's coming out right now. It's going to be really hard to guess what it is because it's wrapped so well. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to guess it's a lawnmower. He's guessing it's a lawnmower. All right. You're right. You can keep the lawnmower. That's what we got you. You got a lawnmower. Uh, it was actually your wife who picked it, so it's kind of a gift yeah. for her. We, we've, but, we've, we've actually had the same lawnmower for like 12 years. He's had the same and lawnmower I for 12 it. years. And this he, is amazing. So he's popped. This awesome. is great. This is a gift this for the whole great. family. Now, here's the other thing. So we're not going to sell a gift day on...
the whole family. Like I said, they've given up a lot of time uh, and given up their dad and husband for years. So you can kind of pull out in there. And we heard that the kids really like to do leg or Lego with you. Uh, so we got a couple of Lego sets. Uh, just so something to do on Sunday nights. Thomas isn't going to know what to do without us anymore. So we got that, uh, a little bit of some chocolate, which I think is nice, and Catherine, she's holding the flowers already. Um, thank you for everything that you guys have contributed to the project, whether it was here on stage or just bit by being supportive and to the kids as well. Uh, I know your kids are, Thomas told me one of his first Sundays off that his kids were super pumped that they got their dad on Sunday. So we're excited for them. Uh, and just before we uh, will take the weird lawnmower off stage, but before we just close by singing a couple more songs, uh, we're going to give Thomas one more chance here to say his final goodbyes. So, uh, the only reason why I did this for the last six and a half years was for a new lawnmower, so <laughs> I'm good. Uh, no, you know what, um, like I was kind of saying, I, uh, first of all, like, thanks for letting me speak into your life. Uh, the project, there's not very often that you get to be part of something that you feel is like way bigger than you. And I always felt like the project was way bigger than me. And I had this animal, this big gargantuan animal in my hands just trying to navigate it because I honestly do care very deeply about you, about what we do. The project is very unique in a sense that there's hundreds of young adults that look to us for some sort of help navigating the very basic parts of life and how Jesus plays into that. And it has been an incredible honor and joy, honestly, a joy doing this for the last six or so years. I, um, I can't express how thankful I am that you allowed me to do this. I feel like I should be saying thank you to, and getting you all lawnmowers because honestly, it's been an incredible joy. And I know over the last years, the great thing about the project and one of the hardest things is that there's like so many new people every year. So I know that there are people who've been here since the beginning and some of you are like, I don't even know who you are, man, but great job. Uh, you know, but I, you, I gotta tell you, like, it's been, I, I think of the, the amount of weddings I've done, the amount of conversations we've had, the amount of messages you've had to endure for, from me, you know, from this stage, and you gotta know, thank you for letting me do it. I always felt that way, that you let me do it, and I wouldn't do it if it weren't for you. I want to thank my staff. Honestly, they have become some of my closest friends. They're incredible people. Uh, you know, I think of when Brett started, I think about Haya and Amanda and, and, and Jeff on staff now too. Like, uh, I loved coming to work because of them. They were just incredible. Um, they're amazing people and uh, they were a lot of fun. In fact, one of the hardest parts about the new position is not seeing them every day. And so sometimes I find myself in their office and they're not even there, and it saddens me. And I wonder, what has Jeff done already? And, um, but then I see them here or there, and it's, uh, it makes me happy again. And so I, uh, I love the staff, I love each one of them. And uh, in fact, Haya's actually stayed at our house for a month, uh, for, uh, for you know, a while, while we were away. And so the amount of trust I gave them was incredible. And uh, I love them, they were a joy, and I'm so glad that um, I can leave the project knowing that not only are they in the capable hands of Jeff, who has become a really great friend of mine, um, but I keep leaving the capable hands of the staff. And then also my wife and kids, they sacrifice so much. And so thanks guys. Thanks for letting me doing it. Thanks for being here. I'm still, I, I'm not dying and I am uh, still in the city and uh, I still have the same email address. So feel free to reach out and uh, let me know how you're doing. But thanks. I appreciate it. Appreciate these videos. Thanks guys for putting all this work into it. And uh, love you guys. And I hope and pray always the best for you. So. I don't want it 
just thank you that, just as Thomas said, you see us as son, you see us as daughter, and you fight for us, God. You defend us. You see us, no matter how lost we might feel, how caught up we might feel, whatever's happening in our world, you see us. You see straight to the heart, and you just love every every little bit. So, God, we just thank you for your love, God, and we, um, yeah, we just invite you into our hearts um, this evening and this week, God, that you would continue to speak um, into our lives in your name. Amen.